All right, you guys. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a few of the causes of World War One, just as a review, and then we're going to get into actually how the war began. I'm going to overview how the United States got involved in the war, and I feel like just bring together some of the things that might for you be missing, because I know it's harder when we're not in class and stuff like that. So let's start with bringing it all together. We can talk about different causes of World War I, but all probably at the base of all of this is this issue of nationalism. So in the late 1800s, nationalism or pride in your country and your desire to strengthen your country, have your country be only people who are your own ethnic group and your own um, religion and that kind of thing has grown. And as a result, it's causing conflict. And a lot of countries are trying to determine for themselves who is going to be in charge, like Serbia wanting its own nation and wanting to bring all the Slavic people together. So what you see is that with political nationalism is you have a lot of small countries wanting their freedom from larger empires. So the Ottoman Empire is going to start to fall apart. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire is going to start to fall apart. And then you also have colonies that are going to want their freedom as well. And then you have economic capitalism, which has caused powerful countries to compete for power in other areas of the world, um, including um, with imperialism and the Dust Revolution. So you've got all of this pride in your country that results in thinking your country economically should be better and more powerful and politically should be um, its own entity and you shouldn't be controlled by other people. And that's going to lead to a lot of conflict. And we know that our acronym MAIN is very important where we talk about militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. So Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of the United States during World War I, um, initially called this the war to end all wars. It was called the Great War until World War II came about and they started labeling this and they saw that this was really, World War II was closely connected to World War I and so they changed it and started calling it World War I. But initially it was called the Great War and a lot of people thought that the reason that you would get involved in this war and the reason the United States got involved in this war was they thought that they would end wars for the future and we would never do this again. And that's not true. <laughs> so the first cause that we, I just want to remind you about is imperialism. When I talk about nationalism, I talk about pride in your country. Each thought that they were better and were in comp intense competition for power throughout the world. There were limited resources and markets to sell your goods because of the from the Industrial Revolution. And so people started, European countries started to have territorial disputes over um, African and Asian countries that they had taken over. We've already looked at maps, so I'm not going to throw them out here, but I do wanna bring up a new topic, which is Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine was a piece, a small piece of territory in between Germany and France, and I'm gonna to go to that right now. So. Alsace-Lorraine, you can see, is right here. It's this territory between Germany and France. And there was something called the Franco-Prussian War. That was when Germany fought France in 1870. And in that war, um, Germany won. And they took Alsace-Lorraine. Sorry, oops, go back one. They took Alsace-Lorraine from France. So this was an area that was French-speaking um, that had been part of France for a very long time, and Germany took it. So at this point... France is going to be seeking a way to get this territory back. And World War I becomes a perfect time where France feels like it can get revenge for their loss in 1870 to Germany in the Franco-Prussian War. So I want to bring up Alsace-Lorraine because sometimes you'll hear about this territory. It's a territory that has gone back and forth between Germany from 1870, World War I, World War II. And whenever it goes back and forth, they always force the people in that country to speak the language of whoever's in charge. So they'll speak French and German very well because they've been part of each of those countries for a long time. All right, so I'm going to go back to here. Um, and then, so that's Alsace-Lorraine. We know about Africa and Asia and all the different areas that have been taken over. And then you already watched a video, so review, review, review. The Balkans area that we just talked about, um, I'll go back to this map, was being fought over who has more influence in this area, Austria, Hungary, or Russia. And Russia was on the side of Serbia. And right in this area right here, if you can see where my cursor is, this is where Sarajevo is. And this is where the assassination, assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is going to take place. All right. So the next major cause is 
militarism, and we've talked about this before, it's the buildup of armaments or weapons. It's an extension of nationalism because you're showing your strength of your country and you're showing that your country can be powerful based on how big your military is. They believe that being a great power meant that you had a large standing army. And so just to give you some numbers that might be helpful for your essay, Germany had 8.5 million, Russia had 4.5 million, France 3.5 million, Austria-Hungary 3 million. And the British Navy is as large as all the others combined. So the British had a huge Navy. And then the other thing is that they were planning, a lot of these European countries already had plans of how they would attack um, other countries and they were just waiting for an opportunity to put it in action. And so the most um, famous is something called the Schlieffen Plan. The Schlieffen Plan was a German military plan that had been on the books since the late 1800s. And they're just, Germany is just looking for a chance to attack France again. And so this is what it would look like. So the Schlieffen plan was this idea that they would sweep through a neutral country, Belgium, and that they would, normally this is like the Maginot line. This is an area where France had a lot of armaments that it was easily defended. This is where an area where they, France thought Germany would attack right through this area of Verdun and stuff like that. So France was prepared for Germany to come right in this area, but France is going to be tricky. And in their Schlieffen plan, they're going to sweep around and try to cut in behind and trap the French soldiers between the German soldiers on this side and the German soldiers that have swept in behind. So famous plan had been on the books was um, in Germany. They had talked about it. They had thought about it. Um, one of the things about the Schlieffen plan that's really important is this plan is actually going to trigger and bring Britain into the war. Britain might not have gotten into the war as early. They didn't have quite as extreme of an alliance with France as the dual um, alliance that you read between Germany and Austria-Hungary where they were required to help each other. Um, but England does not like the fact that neutral Belgium was invaded and specifically Belgium is a great point. If Germany were to attack England, they would do it from the shores of Belgium. And so this seemed like a huge threat to Great Britain and that's why they declared war as they claimed it was because of the um, going into neutral Belgium. So that's just a little background on that. You know all about the alliances, growing rivalries, they set up these alliances, they think it's gonna keep peace, but it doesn't. And you can kind of see, sorry, here, the Triple Entente, Russia, France, Great Britain. What are their issues? What's in their powder keg? Russia has internal conflict that they're going to be having problems with. France has got wants revenge and wants to regain power. Great Britain is fighting over who the, has the best navy with Germany, and they want to maintain their empire. Those are the big issues for them. The Triple Alliance, you've got Germany thinking... They're a new nation. They want more power. They're building up their military. Austria-Hungary is struggling. It's a struggling country. It doesn't have a lot of unity. It has a lot of ethnic division, and a lot of places want to break off and become their own countries. Italy, it just wants territory. And so once the war starts, Italy actually switches sides because I think they look at who can give them what they want, and they realize if they're allied with Austria-Hungary, they're not going to get the territory they wanted, which is from Austria-Hungary. So they pick the opposite side. So World War I is going to begin. This is kind of a uh, flow chart to sh show you how it begins to kind of get, how did this all happen? The Archduke is assassinated by, by a Serbian terrorist group, the Black Hand. Austria is going to give Serbia an ultimatum that essentially says, we need to come in and take over the investigation in your country. It essentially takes away their independence. Serbia obviously wants to be independent. So it agrees to many of the things, says you can come in, you can investigate with us, but we're still in charge. Austria says, that's not what we told you. We told you you could just, you either let us do this or we're going to war. And so Austria declares war on Serbia. Russia now, because they're friends with Serbia, will mobilize its troops and it's going to send them to, west to the Austrian border. The thing about Russian mobilization of troops, they had not declared war, but mobilization during this time period when it takes a really long time to get your troops to where they need to be to actually fight, most people would say mobilization is an act of war. And so you don't need to necessarily declare it because you've moved your troops there, you are declaring war. So Russia sends its troops to the Austrian border. Austria responds by declaring war on Russia. Now, why would Austria do that? Because they knew Germany had that dual alliance. They also had to declare war because it's Russia, right? So Germany declares war on Russia. 
Then Germany turns around because their thing about the Schlieffen plan was they needed to knock France out of the war because they do not want to fight at what's called a two front war. So they need to defeat France really quickly because they thought Russia would take longer. And so they're going to put the Schlieffen plan into effect. They're going to immediately declare war on France and they're going to invade through Belgium. Well, the result of that is that brings England into the war. So England declares war on Germany. Then Austria declares war on England. Everybody's fighting World War I. Okay, so I know it's like a lot of things, but this all happened. They call it like the guns of August. It all happened in one month. So it's very quick. Um, Archduke is assassinated at the end of June. And by August, we have World War I. So the teams are going to change a little once the war starts. We talked about this. You'll start to call them the central powers and the allies. Italy is going to switch sides. So that means that Germany and Austria-Hungary are going to need to find a friend. And they decide to pull in the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is always already falling apart. So if you look at this, you go, oh, the central powers really just have Germany and two, two countries that are falling apart. The allies are going to have France, Russia, Great Britain, Italy, and the United States. And you'll notice that Russia will get out of the war early in March of 1918 because they will be having their own um, communist revolution within their country. And the United States is going to come in in April of 1917. So there will be a little bit of an adjustment. Obviously, the allies are going to win this war. So why does the United States enter World War I? Um, there's a couple of reasons. The most famous is what's called unrestricted submarine warfare. You should have um, researched U-boats. Um, so we're still trading with Europe during the beginning of the war. We're sending passenger ships as well as cargo ships. We're really helping the Allies if we haven't directly declared war on Germany and stuff. But economically, we're helping them, giving them weapons and that kind of thing. So what does Germany do? They say, you can't do that. You, you can't help them. And so they start to say, well, if your ship's out in the middle of the Atlantic, then you are fair game to be um, sunk. And so they have their U-boats out there. They're searching for ships, and they sink something called the Lusitania. And as a result, it, a whole bunch of um, Americans are killed. Um, it is a passenger ship, and it becomes a rallying cry. There were more than just one ship that was sunk by the U-boats, but the Lusitania is famous because some really important people were on that ship that died. Um, the funny thing is there was a person on that ship. I guess it's not funny, but they died. But they had been scheduled to go on to the Titanic, which when, was um, earlier, 1912, I think. They were supposed to be on the Titanic. They missed the Titanic, but then they got on the Lusitania, and then they died on the Lusitania. Tragic, I guess. So that's one reason is all the submarine warfare of the United States. It's hurting our economy. We want to get this war over with so that we can start to trade with Europe because that's very important to our economy. The other thing is something called the Zimmerman telegram. This is a telegram sent by a German official to Mexico. And in this telegram, they essentially say, if Mexico will attack the United States, uh, that Germany will help Mexico to regain the territory that she lost, that the United, or that Mexico lost in the Mexican-American War. So like, you know, parts of California and Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and that kind of stuff, that they were going to help them get it back. So the United States is like, you didn't just tell Mexico to attack us. You've got to be crazy. And so they used a couple of these things as well as economic reasons for um, getting the United States ready and said, you need to get involved in this war. A lot of people think that the United States got involved in the war to have a voice in the outcome of the war, because if you fight in it, you're more likely to be able to discuss how you want the world to be after the end of it. But if you're not involved, no one's going to listen to you. So a lot of people think also that the United States got involved so that we could have a voice in the peace, which will be very important. Um, Russia is going to exit the war in 1918 because they're having their own internal revolution. Their czar gets killed. I think you probably heard of Anastasia and Rasputin, some of those famous characters, if you've watched the Disney film. So there's a revolution. And one of the things communists believe is that they shouldn't be fighting wars for capitalists. They should um, be fighting a war with the factory owners. And so they um, have their Russian revolution. And so they have to get out of this war. Why did the allies win? U.S. came in, new soldiers, fresh soldiers are going to come in mostly on the Western Front, and they're going to lift morale 
People were devastated. Trench warfare is horrible. And so having fresh soldiers is very important. Also, and this is key, Germany, even when it does surrender, when um, they are actually still on French territory. So it wasn't like they had been pushed back. I think Germany just kind of thought, this is enough. Like, why are we fighting this anymore? It was Austria, Hungary, and Serbia that started this. Russia's done with. They're weakened because they had a revolution. With, so Germany didn't worry about Russia anymore. And so they really just wanted to stop the war. And so Germany had heard that Woodrow Wilson came up with something called 14 points. And these 14 points essentially didn't punish anybody for the war, said everybody's kind of at fault. So let's make a peace that lasts. And so when Germany heard that, they said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. It wasn't really our fault. I blame Russia. You know, they had all these excuses. And so the result was that Germany is going to surrender even when I don't think they were going to last much longer, but they definitely had not been defeated. So Germany surrendered yet had not been defeated. And this is going to become a big issue when Hitler comes to power, because he's going to essentially say that the government that surrendered had sold out the German soldiers and that Germany never lost World War I. So they'll claim that even though they were on their way to losing it, they just hadn't been pushed back yet. So there's a lot there, but the U.S. comes in, Russia gets out of the war because of their revolution, and then Germany um, decides to surrender probably a little bit before they would have been defeated. So just a couple of visuals for you to see. Um, a lot of propaganda came out saying, hey, remember the Lusitania, you need to join this war. So to get people involved, um, there's I don't want to torture you too much, but there's a song about the Lusitania, and I thought I'd play it for you for just one second. It's really kind of cheesy. <laughs> So they used songs and they used a lot of things to get people to get really upset about how the United States has treated, was treated and kind of get us into the war. So that's one of the songs. There's a song called Over There, the idea that you need to go over there. This one was very famous. I won't torture you with them. They all sound similar. They have similar like tones and stuff. But just to give you some stats at the end, military deaths, about 8 million. Civilian deaths, 6.5 million. On the Western Front in just 1915 alone, 612 German, 612,000 Germans were killed or wounded, 279,000 British casualties, and 1.2 million French casualties in just one year. All this time, very little territory gained and lost because that's what the Western Front is like with trench warfare. Um, in one battle called the Battle of Champagne, it wasn't a celebration, um, 500 yards um, was gained, but 50,000 soldiers died. So not very much. Think of five football fields. Um, cost, approximate cost, monetary value is $281,887,000,000. Value at the time, not current value. So in 1918, cost of this war. So um, you will have some questions because this is an ed puzzle. So obviously you don't need to finish your Cornell notes, but hopefully that helps you just kind of review, get an idea of what bring together all of World War I. Um, and then it'll help you to write your essay about what caused World War I. Um, and good luck. All right. Talk to you later. See ya.